One of the defining moments of the 20th century was the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925. It is usually invoked to represent the triumph of reason, progress, liberty, and all those good things over superstition, backwardness, constraint, and all those bad things. Also included on the list is the triumph of science over religion. But what it represents is hardly what it was. The trial itself was a charade, staged mostly for the press and for the economic benefit of Dayton, Tennessee. Two gigantic figures of American law and politics descended on that tiny town and represented the two sides. Famed criminal lawyer Clarence Darrow and former Secretary of State and presidential runner-up William Jennings Bryan. John T. Scopes, a physical education instructor, was approached by the American Civil Liberties Union and agreed to help them run a test case of Tennessee state law which forbade the teaching of evolution. Never mind that Scopes had never actually taught evolution, he agreed to play the role of a pawn after all the other teachers, including the principal of the school, had turned down the ACLU's offer. The trial was rife with paradox. Although the man supposedly on trial was Scopes, it was actually Christian fundamentalism that was on trial. Although Scopes technically was found guilty, the teaching of evolution was vindicated. Although Darrow, who was defending Scopes, technically lost his case, he was hugely successful in his scathing attack on fundamentalism. And although Bryan, representing the prosecution in the state, won, in the course of the trial, he literally found himself on the witness stand defending a literal interpretation of Genesis and in the process indicting fundamentalism and humiliating himself. The general consensus is that Darrow obliterated Bryan, a consensus helped along by the accounts in the press written by the acerbic columnist and curmudgeon H.L. Mencken. Detached objectivity was not Mencken's strong point. He actually met with Darrow and the other lawyers from the ACLU before the trial and helped them strategize. He told them that getting Scopes acquitted would be worth a day's headlines in the newspapers and then no more, but smearing Brian would be good for a long while. As a matter of fact, they weren't able to get Scopes acquitted. He was found guilty of teaching evolution and fined $100. To add insult to what amounted to a non-injury, Mencken's paper paid the fine. To add more than injury to the insult, William Jennings Bryan collapsed and died a week after the trial ended. In addition to the paradox that the winners were the losers and vice versa, within a generation, Darwin's theory of evolution emerged from the muck, fully formed, and devoured its formal rival. A new secular orthodoxy evolved in public classrooms ac across America, a denial that the universe or life or mankind had a divine origin. Darwin had gone to the head of the class, and the creator, formerly known as God, was expelled from school altogether. This was the beginning of the huge disconnect that still exists in this country, where the media establishment and the academic establishment do not represent what the majority of people think and believe. It was, as I say, paradoxical, which is why it caught the attention of a journalist on the other side of the Atlantic who was well acquainted with paradox, G.K. Chesterton. The Scopes monkey trial, Chesterton realized, had immediately reached mythical proportions. It was the clash of two completely different worldviews. But Chesterton said the courtroom was not the proper place to settle such an important controversy. And in fact, it wasn't settled. He duly noted that the journalists had had their joke, but he thought perhaps they were a little too eager to attack the Bible and to swallow Darwin, or as he put it, to choose to be on the side of the monkeys as opposed to on the side of the angels. But he also pointed out a thornier and more practical problem that continues to plague public education, even though the press and the politicians and the courts continue to dance around the issue. It is the great paradox of the modern world. 
but at the very time when the world decided that people should not be coerced about their form of religion, it also decided that they should be coerced about their form of education. It is obviously unfair and unreasonable that secular education should forbid one man to say a religion is true and allow another man to say it is untrue. It is obviously essential to justice that non-sectarian education should cut both ways and that if the orthodox must cut out the statement that man has a divine origin, the materialist must cut out the statement that he has a wholly and exclusively bestial origin. In the years following the Scopes trial, Clarence Darrow wasn't in the courtroom much. He had found a new, lucrative career when he discovered that people would pay to see him argue, and he made a lot of money doing it. Will Rogers, America's cowboy philosopher, warned prospective opponents, don't anybody debate with Darrow. He'll make a monkey out of any opponent. He hadn't been in Tennessee two weeks till he had the entire state jumping on the backs of chairs, picking fleas off each other. In 1930, five years after the trial, G.K. Chesterton came to America to be a guest lecturer at the University of Notre Dame. While he was in the U.S., he received inv invitations from all around the country to give lectures, and he also received many invitations to debate other public figures. He accepted as many invitations as he could. One of those was an offer to debate Clarence Darrow. The debate was held in January of 1931 in New York City. It took place in the city's grand hall, the Mecca Temple, which was filled to its 4,000 seat capacity for the occasion. The announced topic of this debate is, will the world return to religion? I'm sure it will come as no surprise that my distinguished opponent from England will be arguing in the affirmative. <laughs> but I, however, have found that people prefer reason to superstition. And because people are reasonable, the world will move forward, not backward. The progress of science is constant. Now, it uh, may surprise Mr. Darrow to know that I completely agree with him. <laughs> People are indeed reasonable, or so I have almost always found. And that is precisely why they embrace a religious understanding of existence and will always continue to do so. Humanity, you see, is not complete without religion. If the opponents of religion try to do away with it, uh, if religion is suppressed, suffering inevitably results. But anyone who tries to suppress religion will fail. It'll be as if, as if some austere sect tried to suppress laughter. <laughs> there will always be laughter as long as people hold absurd religious beliefs that the rest of us can laugh at. <laughs> but religion cannot possibly last, so we're going to have to find other things to laugh at. The religious idea is based on crude and uninformed theories of the universe. There is less religion, less supernaturalism every year. Mankind has moved beyond religion, and to return to it would be a backward step. Enlightened men will not go back to the primitive idea that God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. Such simplistic ideas of the world and such literal interpretations of the Bible are, of course, contradicted by science. But literal interpretations of the Bible are also contradicted by the Bible itself. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lion of Judah. Well, which is it? Now, I'm not certain if my opponent is debating with me or with some fundamentalist made an aunt of mine. <laughs> Perhaps Mr. Dare would be interested to know that there is distinction between the way Roman Catholics and fundamentalists interpret Scripture. The Bible is a much larger book 
than the small thing that some people make it. You see, there is such a thing as allegory and symbol and parable. Whether or not the garden was an allegory, the truth can be very well allegorized as a garden. And the point of the allegory, I should think, is this. Man, whatever else he is, is certainly not merely one of the plants of the garden <laughs> or one of the animals of the garden. He is something else, something strange and solitary. Never mind those distinctions. Is Mr. Chesterton saying that he does not accept the theory of evolution? <laughs> Mr. Chesterton is merely saying that Darwin's missing link is still missing. <laughs> you see, if there were a missing link in a real chain, it wouldn't be called a chain at all, now would it? Evolution as an explanation of the cause of all living things is still faced with the problem of producing rabbits out of an empty hat, a process commonly involving some hint of design. <clears throat> Does Mr. Chesterton reject science? Does he believe instead in miracles? <clears throat> of course one does not have to reject science to believe in miracles. It is science that confirms that miracles really are miracles. Of course I believe in miracles, and so does most of mankind. But believing in miracles does not make it easy to believe in them. That is why they are called miracles. The most unbelievable thing about miracles is that they happen. The point? Um, what I am trying to say is science disproves the miracles which organized religion asks us to believe, and everyone knows it. Everyone doesn't know it. The most scientific and critical investigators have the greatest difficulty in explaining such modern miracles as the cures at Lourdes. The modern world swarms with miracles. If you say that they are not reported and testified to, not alleged to have occurred, I say you are a baby in the knowledge of the modern world. <laughs> to maintain that religion has more authority than science, that, that is babyish. That is the cause of ignorance. It, it is the conclusion of every mature, educated man that science can always be believed and has always shown that... <laughs> science, you see, is not infallible. <laughs> <clears throat> you mentioned the word infallible. Well, I am not talking about infallibility and other such dogmatic terms. I would like to clarify one thing. I am an agnostic. That does not clarify anything. Agnostic is simply the Greek word for the Latin word, ignorant. <laughs> I, I will insist that the definition of the word agnostic is that of a doubter. Everyone is an agnostic to the beliefs and creeds they do not accept. Of course you would not admit you are wrong in your definition, because the doubter or the skeptic never thinks he is wrong. He never thinks that there is any wrong, but neither does he think there is any right. If he is sincere in his skepticism, he really cannot think at all, because thinking involves accepting certain things, things that cannot be proved, but can only, can only be accepted on faith. All thinking begins with assumptions that cannot 
be proved. In logic, we call these axioms, but the real skeptic has nowhere to begin because he must doubt everything. And so, and so he sinks through floor after floor of a bottomless universe. Reason can only be built on faith, and that faith is the foundation of our civilization. The truth is that the origin of what we call civilization is not due to faith, but to skepticism. The modern world is the child of doubt and inquiry, as the ancient world was the child of fear and faith. And the man of the modern world is far too clever to, to believe in the ridiculous claims of religion. <laughs> Whenever I hear the man too clever to believe, it is like hearing of a nail that is too good to hold down the carpet, or a bolt that is too strong to keep a door shut. <laughs> what is man? Thomas Carlyle defined man as an animal who makes tools. But ants and beavers and many other animals make tools in that they make an apparatus. No, man is much better defined as an animal that makes dogmas. <laughs> Trees have no dogmas, <laughs> and turnips, turnips are singularly broad-minded. <laughs> Religion, especially your Roman Catholic Church, has always been opposed to scientific progress and to the growth of knowledge. <laughs> the whole history of the Catholic Church is one long guardianship of learning and knowledge. From the days when the monasteries preserved all the existing science and learning until our modern days, it was the church that gave the modern world its hospitals and universities and paved the way for the discoveries boasted by modern science. Because the church has always defended reason. These things have been going on always and everywhere. And everybody has heard of them, except Mr. Darrell. <laughs> One eyewitness who had attended the debate said she had gone fearing for Chesterton because of Darrow's reputation for annihilating his opponents. She was shocked to find out how the two compared. Next to Chesterton, she said, Darrow appeared positively muddle-headed. Another observer said, it was billed as the clash of the titans, but only one titan showed up. One reviewer wrote that although Darrow was supposed to be the defender of science against Chesterton, it was obvious that Darrow knew much less science than Chesterton did. Darrow said that an atom was the same thing as an electron. He didn't know anything about Mendel's law of heredity, but simply assumed it was wrong because it contradicted Darwin, and besides, Mendel was a Catholic monk. And when Chesterton asked uh, him about physics and talked about the theories of Eddington and Jean's, it was patently clear that Darrow had no idea what he meant. Mr. Chesterton's argument was like Mr. Chesterton, amiable, courteous, jolly. It was always clever. It was full of nice turns of expression, and altogether a very adroit exhibition by one of the world's ablest intellectual fencing masters and one of its most charming gentlemen. Mr. Darrow's personality, by contrast, seemed rather colorless and certainly very dour. His attitude seemed almost surly. His argument was conducted on an amazingly low intellectual level. Mr. Darrow's victory over William Jennings Bryan at the Scopes trial had been too cheap and easy. He remembered it not wisely, but too well. His arguments are still the arguments of village atheists. In this debate, he still seemed to be trying to shock and convince yokels. Mr. Chesterton's deportment was irreproachable, but I am sure that he was secretly unhappy. He has debated some of the great minds of Europe. With this opponent, he was not even getting his exercise. Chesterton admitted that he was somewhat disappointed with the debate. He said that when he tried to talk about Greek cults and Asiatic asceticism, Darrow appeared unable to think about anything except Jonah and the whale. The audience was stunned by what it had witnessed. One person who was at the debate said that when it was over, 
Everyone just sat there, not wishing to leave. They were loath to let the light die. A vote was taken at the Mecca Temple, and the audience, by a more than two-to-one margin, said Chesterton had won the debate. So, why do we hear so much about Darrow's victory at the Scopes trial and so little about his defeat at the hands of Chesterton? Two of the three main biographies of Darrow do not even mention the debate with Chesterton. The third treats it as a minor embarrassment. Perhaps the reason historians have been silent about this debate and why all the modern invokers of Scopes find it convenient to ignore Chesterton is because he unsettles questions that they insist are settled. They do not wish to admit that science has not really triumphed over religion, as they claim. They do not have the intellectual energy to grapple with the paradox that would allow both science and religion to have the right to stake their claims. Instead, we ban any mention of divine origin in the name of academic freedom, and then stubbornly ignore the natural implications of a purely natural explanation of the universe and of life and of that byproduct we call civilization. 